His team fucked up his entire dosing protocol. The money got to their head and now they turned into like Sam Banks uh, cocaine nerd sex cult or something. A preprint came out, which is a paper, that they were evaluating several longevity interventions, including rapamycin. It showed that rapamycin accelerated the biological speed of aging in humans across 16 epigenetic clocks. This study barely even mentions rapamycin at all. Brian Johnson is shit-talking rapamycin, and we've seen this happen before, but uh, one of our uh, newsletter subscribers, I guess we call it, had sent us this video, and he wanted either me or Brendan to react to it in order to really dissect everything that's going on. But before I do start this video, please bless us by leaving a like and a comment. They help the algorithm a lot. And down in the description, you can redeem your free gift, which is a course about peptides made by Brendan Henry himself. And soon we're going to be releasing a, well, the best book that's ever been written about peptides. Uh, I haven't watched this video. Not yet. This is my first time watching it, reacting to it uh, just raw with you guys and have my glass of wine here. So cheers. For the past four years, I have been working with a team of medical professionals trying to build the world's best health protocol. Now <laughs> now in dosing humans with rapamycin, researchers were cautious because of the significant side effects they'd seen in organ transplant patients. These include metabolic disruptions like high cholesterol, tissue swelling, soft tissue infections, impaired wound healing, but more recent studies show that intermittent dosing or lower doses reduce these side effects. I hate to sound like a hater. I'm not. I'm, I mean, I'm a fan of what he does. I don't know if he's trying to fear monger, but I just hope he's not. So let's get into the science. How does rapamycin work? Let's. Rapamycin's potential in longevity centers around its ability to inhibit something called mTOR C1. This is a growth pathway whose overactivation plays a role in many age-related diseases. That's, yes, that's accurate. The overactivation of mTORC1 does play a role in accelerating diseases and so on and so forth. Yes, it does. However, how can you really judge if yours is overactivated? And in his case, it's the exact opposite. And I'll get to that. I'll tell you why he experienced all these side effects. But to go on further... Yeah, so inhibiting mTORC1 once a week is something completely different from what Brian Johnson did. If you want to naturally inhibit mTORC c one you can do things such as caloric restriction, fasting, exercise, and AMPK activators. Inhibiting mTORC c one is what rap- You might be getting close to why I think he experienced all the rapamycin side effects that he's going to talk about, but if you haven't, let's continue watching. Rapamycin is doing directly. So what were the benefits we were looking at? Reduction of my biological age, my speed of aging, and organ-specific biological age markers, as well as potential benefits for rejuvenation of the immune system and skin. But it's not free. Rapamycin also inhibits mTORC2, which has been linked to the side effects that we discussed before the metabolic dysfunctions. Rapamycin also suppresses the immune system and specifically NK cells, your cancer-killing cells, so it has a double-edged sword, making the dosing protocol very important. Other risks include... Making the dosing protocol very important. And that's why his team fucked up his entire dosing protocol. Knowing the risks of having too much rapamycin in my body to suppress my immune system, but also wanting just enough for the benefits, we tried many things. We tried protocols including five of these pills per week. We tried a protocol of six pills one week and 13 pills the next week. We tried 13 and 13. So he provides a dosing protocol in the video that's different from the one he specified on uh, November 14th, 2024. So. On November 14th, 2024, I'll pull up the tweet for you on the screen. He said, I have tested various rapamycin protocols, including weekly 5, 6, and 10 milligram dose schedules, bi-weekly 13 milligrams, and alternating weekly 6, 13 to optimize rejuvenation and limit side effects. Now, when he says bi-weekly 13 milligrams, I really uh, hope he means like he took, let's say, Six milligrams one day and seven the other day, and he didn't take 13 and 13. That would be horrible. He says he did uh, five, six, and 10 milligrams per week schedules. Peter Atia, okay, Peter Atia, who's the biggest believer in rapamycin, goes at up to eight milligrams, okay? And then he can do that for, for three months and then stopping for two because he can't tolerate it anymore. Mr. Brian Johnson was on it constantly, no breaks. Nothing. Number two is 
Brian Johnson already takes AMP kinase activators, okay? Brian Johnson is already in a calorie deficit. Brian Johnson already exercises. Brian Johnson, Brian Johnson already fasts. The AMP kinase is way too activated in this man. He doesn't have enough mTORC1 signaling as is. mTORC2 inhibition is not ideal, especially for the heart, it's not ideal. But how much of that mTORC2 inhibition is happening because your dose is way too high, Mr. Brian Johnson? I mean, why couldn't you just, why couldn't his team say, okay, let's try one milligram a week, two milligrams a week, five milligrams a week, and then having breaks after two or three months, and then restarting? Why does it have to be five milligrams once a week, and you always take it? or six milligrams, or 10 milligrams, or 13 milligrams bi-weekly. I, I mean, I hope that doesn't mean 13 mo Monday and 13 on Thursday or something crazy like that. Because, see, when you redose a drug so high and so often, you uh, risk it getting into what's called steady state. And if rapamycin is in steady state, you're in big trouble, especially if you're like Brian Johnson. He's also vegan, okay? So now we have, he exercises a lot, he is in a calorie deficit, he is a vegan, okay? He uh, fasts and he takes AMP kinase activators, such as things like metformin and so on. So you already have reduced mTORC1 signaling. Why are you just hammering that vector even more? It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. And that's why I really, it makes me wonder about the credentials of his team and uh, to be honest, their uh, intentions. This dosing regimen looks like something where you know, they almost did it on purpose to try and make rapamycin look bad, okay? You know, when you add a drug to your protocol or a peptide to your protocol or a supplement with your, to your protocol, you, you got to make sure you're not hitting the same vector over and over and over and over again. Like, imagine combining semaglutide with dulaglutide. Why would you do that? Like, they do the same thing. Just take the optimal dose of one of them. Imagine combining uh, nebivalol and extended-release metoprolol. It makes no sense. Like, even just two things hitting the same vector doesn't make much sense. In the case of longevity, I mean, maybe you can be in a calorie deficit and take rapamycin and see how you tolerate it for longevity and measure a biological age through DNA methylation tests or telomere length tests, whatever. But to do already four or five things that uh, hammer AMP kinase and lower mTORC1 signaling and then taking an mTORC1 inhibitor with dual mTORC1 and mTORC2 inhibition and then complaining about side effects. Like, how does this make sense to his team of 10 brilliant doctors or whatever that he pays like millions every year? Let's continue watching. I did, however, notice side effects. Cankers in my mouth. Or maybe a wound wouldn't heal fast enough. Yes, that's the mouth sores. I read a study once about using rapamycin once weekly. And the most common, the most common side effect was these mouth sores. If you're taking it for longevity, you know there's gonna be a price to pay. Okay, you know it. And um, mouth sores, they're a small price to pay for Peter Atia, for example. That's why he uh, would take it. I, I, if I remember correctly, three months on and then two months off or something, or maybe one month off. But he hammered the uh, mTORC1 inhibition too much and AM, AMP kinase activation too much. He hammered that vector way too strongly and he paid the price for it. It is not rapamycin's fault, but let's continue with the video. A wound wouldn't heal fast enough. Cholesterol disruptions. In terms of uh, wounds that won't heal fast enough, that is due to you, sir, inhibiting mTORC1 too much. It is not rapamycin's fault. How do you expect your wounds to heal properly? Like how? It's not his fault, you know, he's not educated properly on this stuff. He's just a fan, it's, it's his team's fault. It increased my resting heart rate, which as you know from watching my videos, it is the most important biomarker I track. Resting heart rate might indeed be raised by the mTORC2 inhibition. And uh, rapamycin is a lot more selective to mTORC1 than to mTORC2. But if you just hammer the uh, mTORC1 vector and your rapamycin dose is pretty high, you know, he's saying that he did 6 and 13 milligrams alternating weeks. That's insane. That's insane. You're going to get some mTORC2 inhibition. And that's why probably he got the cardiac side effects. But let's go on. Now, these side effects continued for several years. Now, we suspected rapamycin would be the cause of these side effects because we'd read the literature. So we wanted to put it to the test. So with that in mind, Barely we decided read to literature. test discontinuing rapamycin. Barely. And sure enough, without it, my blood glucose dropped, my cholesterol corrected, 
soft tissue infections went away. The side effects were in fact from rapamycin. The rise in glucose, I would imagine that's due to poor nutrient utilization, okay? Or inhibiting mTORC1 too much to the point that your pancreatic beta cells can't heal properly or a combination of both. I mean, I've been seeing clients for years, man, and most of them want to try like uh, rapamycin or the alternative that we have for it for longevity. And I haven't seen spiked blood glucose <laughs> at all, to be honest. I haven't dealt with anybody like him, to be honest, because I would never let anybody uh, work under me and be like him. Now, we also had some concerns about cancer. Remember, rapamycin suppresses the immune system, including NK cells which are your cancer-fighting cells, and we were worried it might have some kind of long-term increased risk with this oppression. <sighs> well, in terms of long-term increased risk with the suppression of natural killer cells, doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you're not perpetually inhibiting the, uh, the activity of these cells. Really, rapamycin, and especially depending on the dose, it's not gonna, like the half-life is 60 hours which makes the uh, total life of it in your system uh, 60 times five, so 300 hours and it completely leaves your system. Could that raise cancer risk if you're taking it every day? I would say, of course. I mean, you are suppressing your immune system still, but like taking it once a week, the real goal is to inhibit cell division and uh, really both uh, stop cells from becoming senescent, which is the cells that uh, divide as, mon as many times as they can maxim maximally divide cells, which is around 40 or 50 times or so, if I remember correctly. But he is not accounting for the uh, inhibition of cell division. If you don't account for the inhibition of cell division and you only look at the natural killer uh, cell activity being inhibited in a vacuum, sure, it can look so goddamn scary and this is gonna raise my risk of cancer and blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> if you dose it properly, I mean, you'll most likely not have to worry about any of that. A preprint came out, which is a paper, that they were evaluating several longevity interventions, including rapamycin. It showed that rapamycin accelerated the biological speed of aging in humans across 16 epigenetic clocks. Now, first of all, the study's called uh, DNA Methylation Aging Biomarkers Are Responsive, Insights from 51 Longevity Interventional Studies in Humans. This study barely even mentions rapamycin at all. Let me tell you what Mr. Johnson is worried about with this study, okay? You go to page 50 on this study, okay? And that's when you'll see rapamycin. Here it is, rapamycin, okay, dose one and dose two. So in two different doses, it was tested. And against 16 different biological age clocks, dose one seemed to have a negative effect on one of them, which is this one I'm over with my mouse. And dose two had negative effects on two of them. So... What does that tell me? I don't care. Okay, I don't care. If we, if we take rapamycin and we want those longevity benefits, we're only gonna get them cumulatively as we uh, keep taking it over time because it's a drug that slows down cell division. That's the main point of it. If across 16 different biological age clocks, it had negative effects on one of them in one dose and two of them in another dose, like why do I care? I don't, neither should you. In my opinion, the study, uh, it, like he's acting like it's a randomized control trial that had a placebo group and a rapamycin group, and then they tested their, uh, you know, biological age with DNA methylation before and after. But that's not what happened. Mr. Brian Johnson is blowing this way out of proportion. I'm, I think maybe his team gave him that study so he can, maybe he had the panic episode or whatever, and this team gave him this study to calm down. I don't know what he's like. I'm not making fun of the guy. I respect him a lot. But this is not enough evidence for me to be like, rapamycin is speeding up my aging. Wow, so ironic. And really everything else you're doing is doing exactly what rapamycin is doing, more or less. And you just got too much, man. You overdosed on it. I'm sorry, you overdosed on mTORC1 inhibition. And forgive me if I was too long-winded or blabbered on. I think this was an important video to make. And uh, I really had to explain this because Mr. Brian Johnson is seen as uh, somewhat of an authority now in the longevity space. And I think his team makes rookie mistakes, not just now, but quite frequently, honestly, which is quite disappointing. I really want this guy to succeed. I want him to live to 130, okay? 
But anyway, thank you for watching. I have nothing against Mr. Brian Johnson and definitely nothing against our beautiful viewers. Thank you guys very, very much for subscribing, following, and supporting our channel. And uh, yeah, we're going to bring on a lot more new content. We're going to be releasing a book called Peptide Salvation, authored mainly by Brendan and co-authored by me, produced by our marketing genius, Dan Fox. And Peptide Salvation is going to come on a huge discount, by the way. So for all of those who say our services are too expensive and we don't care about our viewers, that is not true. Peptide Salvation is going to come at an insane discount. Okay, so keep watching out for that. And yeah, this was Dr. Ali, the head transformation specialist at the Peptide Science Institute. Thank you very much for watching this video, especially if you watched it all the way through. And goodbye.